Good morning, everyone. This is Carol Beardmore with the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. I'm a co-chair of the Science Working Group and, and co-lead of Critical Management Question 4, which has to do with physiological impacts to, the, to climate change. Um, we have a webinar series that we've been sponsoring, and uh, this is, I don't know, but maybe our sixth webinar. Um, uh, Gary Romer from uh, New Mexico State uh, University is our presenter today. Um, he's a professor there and has been working on this, this topic, among others, um, for 14 years. Um, I want to make sure everyone <coughs> um, knows that we're going to try this unmuted today, so um, please make sure that uh, your uh, background noise is, is minimal and it and you can mute yourself with star six if you prefer to do that. Um, we will have uh, questions held until the end of the presentation, uh, or you can put them in the chat box. Um, so uh, let's get started. Gary. Okay. Well, one more time. Thanks, Carol. Uh, I appreciate everybody um, attending the webinar and, and for you inviting me. And I'd like to make a note that I myself am not a physiological ecologist, I'm a population ecologist, although sometimes I try to um, invoke a physiological explanations for some of the work that I do. So I have been working with mammal and bird populations for quite some time now, and some of the work that we've done in the desert southwest is uh, relevant to um, concepts of climate change. So um, I'll just move forward a little bit. My screen seems to be frozen for some reason. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, so uh, as you're all probably aware, uh, there's general agreement that the Earth has warmed about a three quarters of a degree centigrade over the past 100 years. And although there are numerous uncertainties in the models that are being used to predict future climate, there is some agreement between the models that we are looking at increasing air temperatures increasing land surface temperatures and decreasing available water. Uh, in a recent study that was conducted in the southwest, we can see that both uh, the maximum temperatures and minimum temperatures have increased throughout the southwestern region. And since about the 1980s, these uh, temperatures have, have always shown increases, both uh, Tmax and Tmins. These increases in temperatures are coupled with increases in population that are also projected to um, increase into the future, especially for states like California and Arizona. So we're not only being faced with the idea of weather patterns, but we're also being faced with increasing numbers of individuals that are going to um, influence landscape use as well. So with regards to the CMQ4 questions, what species could be impacted by physiological stress due to climate change and what extent? And then subsequently, um, what adaptation strategies might be applied to lessen the impact? Hopefully I'll be able to address a little bit of that today. And before I do that, I would just like to review some aspects of, of energy flux in endotherms that um, you know would be affected by climate change. So as you know, um, thermal radiation from the atmosphere and direct solar radiation are going to be influencing um, an organism's body temperature. But uh, an organism typically loses its heat primarily through concepts of, or processes, excuse me, of convection, evaporation, and conduction. And so if we take that to another step and look at an organism's curve of thermogenesis, we can see that that varies with an organism's body mass. And that an organism's thermal neutral zone is the region where its metabolic rate is not increased. And, and therefore its temperature stays within a homeothermic region without metabolic rate increasing. However, when the animal, uh, let's see, here we go. When the animal reaches its upper critical temperature, its metabolic rate has to increase as a consequence of doing things like evaporative water loss in order to maintain homeothermy. When it reaches a point known as its upper lethal temperature, then the animal dies obviously because it can no longer um, maintain homeothermy, proteins denature, et cetera. In a similar fashion, probably unrelated to the current trends in climate, an animal also has a lower lethal temperature, 
at which it can no longer um, increase its metabolic rate through either um, shivering or non-shivering thermogenesis. It becomes too cold and it also dies. So with respect to climate change, if things in, uh, in an organism's physiology, if you will, are going to impact that organism, and from my perspective, um, that impact would have to translate into some impact that's going to affect organism fitness. So this um, quote by Kingsolver kind of gets to, to the point that I tend to um, focus on and, and research in my lab, and that is to understand how these interactions of organisms with the environment are going to affect the characteristics or ecology of the organism, such as age-specific fecundity and mortality, and then how these factors are going to scale up to influence uh, individual uh, populations as well as interspecific dynamics. So as an example, back in 2009, there was a heat wave in Australia that killed thousands of budgerigars, budgerigars, excuse me. And you know those birds basically got to a point where they could no longer evaporative use evaporative water loss in order to cool themselves or at least maintain homeothermy, and they ended up dying. So if organisms reach this state, then climate change is going to have a significant impact. So I conducted, um, or my lab, we conducted three different studies related to these kinds of issues. The first study was to look at a sort of a quintessential desert-adapted rodent, the banner-tailed kangaroo rat, and which environmental variables might influence the survival of the species, or at least the populations of the species. The second looked at short-term drought and how that influenced the reintroduction of populations of black-tailed prairie dogs into Chihuahuan desert grasslands. And then the third looked at um, interactions between kit foxes and coyotes, which basically are involved in an a intra-guild predation relationship, and how the distribution of these organisms in desert systems could potentially be influenced by, by climate change. Okay, so for the first study, uh, elevated surface temperature depressed the survival in banner-tailed kangaroo rats. This was conducted by my graduate student, um, former Martin Moses, in conjunction with um, a colleague, Dr. Jennifer Fry, here at NMSU. And our objective was to evaluate the effect of, of uh, potential environmental drivers on the survival of this sort of quintessential arid adapted rodent. I don't know if you're familiar, but banner-tailed kangaroo rats are about 130 gram kangaroo rats, or they're one of the larger kangaroo rat species. And they are ecosystem engineers in the sense that they dig these large mounds and burrow systems that are used by other organisms, and they also have an impact on the vegetation that surrounds the mound. They um, are larder hoarders, where they basically are central place foragers. They go out and collect seeds and whatnot, and they can bring copious quantities of seeds back into their burrows, which enable them to survive during, say, overwintering times when you know, seed abundance or plant abundance is low. And they also have a number of adaptations that allow them, in addition to mound building and nocturnal activity, they have a number of physiological adaptations that allow them to cope with these very arid environments. Um, they can secrete concentrated urine. They're very good at absorbing water from their feces and having dry feces. And then they have um, really good turbinate respiratory systems for reclaiming water um, from uh, that when they're breathing through um, uh, respiration. So they're a pretty cool little, little rodent. So at any rate, um, we hypothesized that there could be a, a number of environmental drivers that could uh, potentially influence survival. So for example, precipitation um, would be predicted to positively influence survival through its effect on primary productivity. Um, summer dew point and sort of humidity could influence survival because uh, banner-tailed kangaroo has uh, hoard these seeds, and if the humidity in the burrow increases, the seeds become hygroscopic, and so they get more preformed water within the seeds themselves. Uh, vegetation itself uh, and vegetation production could be uh, in influence um, survival, obviously. Um, land surface temperatures, winter land surface temperatures positively influence survivorship if it brings temperatures down in towards or into the thermal neutral zone, whereas um, summer land surface temperatures might be expected to exceed the thermal neutral zone. Uh, density of individuals um, may lessen predation, you know, in the sense that if there's more individuals to go around, then um, the likelihood of you dying as a consequence might be lessened. 
However, if there is many more individuals, you could have habitat saturation, and so that could influence the survival of juveniles because they wouldn't have any places to, to really go in order to be able to, um, um, uh, you know, find a mound themselves, if you will. And then increasing shrub cover could provide more cover for pr predators, and, and that could influence them, their survivorship as well. Okay, so uh, we looked at 11 different study sites across South Central and, and um, Southwestern New Mexico. We have about four years worth of data across these 11 populations. And essentially, we'd set traps on the mounds. And here's Marty um, uh, transferring an animal into a, a, a holding bag or, or a, a control bag. He was weighing animals. And then we would ear tag them. And then he would let them go and meditate for a while. And then this is what they would do. <laughs> So sometimes the uh, um, animals basically didn't like the presence of the trap, and, and you can see how much soil they can move in a single, single evening. At any rate, um, over, the, over this period of time, uh, we had three, almost 3,865 individuals to, to work with. We used uh, an information um, theoretic framework. And in that case, um, many of you are probably familiar, but it's a relatively new statistical paradigm in ecology. And it doesn't focus on the null hypothesis, but rather on multiple working hypotheses, where these hypotheses are represented as models, and the models are ranked from best to least supported in, in terms of using the Akaike information criterion. Um, the Akaike information criterion then links um, information theory to statistical theory through the maximum likelihood self. And when you have a probability, so uh, if your parameter of interest is a probability, such as the P, the probability of capture, or phi, the um, phi or phi, the probability of survival, and then psi, the probability of occupancy, um, you can basically um, use that approach to uh, calculate the deviance. And the deviance is the amount of information that is unexplained, and then also principal parsimony is applied where the number of parameters um, you use, or you're sort of penalized for the number of parameters that you use. And because um, theta is a probability, like the probability of recapture or the probability of survival, um, the probabilities are typically nonlinear, and you can use a link function then in, in a, a way to uh, linearize, uh, linearize this relationship. So, for example, here's theta as a probability in, a, in a, a logistic form. And you can use a logit link function where when you take the natural log of the probability divided by um, uh, the 1 minus the probability, so that's the probability of the event occurring minus divided by the probability of the event not occurring, and you create this sort of linear model where you have a particular covariate that you can include in the model. You have an effect size represented by the regression coefficient and then you have an intercept associated with it. So this is one way that you can introduce covariates into the analysis using a logic link function. So in this particular study then, we um, used information theory in sort of a hierarchical analysis where we looked at a global model of survival and recapture probability. We selected the best model of recapture probability. Um, the best categorical models of survival then were replaced with environmental driver models and then subsequently, we examined um, the importance of various driver, environmental drivers using a variety of, of approaches. So um, in this case, using a Cormac Jolly Seeger survivorship model that's given us a fit value just shows that our data fit the model well. And then when we looked at a model of recapture probability, we used 10 different candidate models and basically came up with the single best approximating model showing that the probability of recapture was essentially constant, but at about point. Uh, z uh, 0.92, excuse me, 0 0.92, um, which is relatively high. That means that, you know, we had a 90% <coughs> catching a, a banner-tailed kangaroo rat if the rat was actually there. Okay, so when we looked at our categorical models of survival, one of the things that popped out was that age was a very important parameter. So there's differences in um, survival between juveniles and adults. But in addition to that, the categorical variables site and time were also uh, relatively important. And so in the next uh, stage of the analysis, we replaced those categorical models with environmental driver models through site and time, right? And we had 30 candidate models with these 15 environmental driver variables that we, that we knew. 
And when we ran the analysis, the, the models that came out to be most well supported were models that included um, summer diurnal land surface temperature as well as vegetation lagged um, by one year. However, if we take a little closer look, we see that only summer, the effect size of summer diurnal land surface temperature had a 95% confidence interval that did not encompass zero, and it also showed that the relationship was negative. Um, all three of the models had relatively high model weight that, that accounted for about, what is that, 43% um, of the um, model weight, and then all of them had relatively high uh, process variation, that is, they explained a fair amount of the process variation. Okay, so when we look at environmental driver importance, um, we also take sort of a hierarchical approach. Uh, we look at relative driver weight, which I just showed you there in, in some of the models. Uh, we look at the slope of the logic coefficient, which is the same as the regression coefficient, and whether or not the 95% confidence interval encompasses zero. Then, uh, as far as the analysis of, of deviance, we look at how much total information is explained, and then out of that information, how much process variation is explained rather than measurement variation. And what that resulted in is that um, land surface temperature has about two and a half to three times more weight than the next nearest driver, which was vegetation lag one year, which suggests, at least with the parameters that we used and the, uh, the sites that we sampled, that summer diurnal land surface temperature had an impact on the survivorship of band-tailed kangaroo rat. Okay, so if we look at adults shown with the closed circles here versus juveniles, remember there was an age effect, and we look at their projected survival with respect to land surface temperature, you can see that as land surface temperature goes up, um, banner-tailed survival probability drops. And so we're not sure what the mechanisms were behind this pattern that we observed, but there are several possible mechanisms. Um, one is that uh, with increasing temperature, it somehow reduces resource availability or, or potential foraging time. It could reduce the preformed water in the food, and that could then um, influence water balance for, for the, the bay rat. Um, mounds also may be an insufficient buffer against such thermal extremes so that either thermal tolerances could be exceeded or that the organism is chronically experiencing temperatures higher than its thermal neutral zone. And that could also then um, lead into the idea that evaporative water, water loss rates could be chronically heightened and so that would um, influence their survival over the long run. And then finally, it could potentially increase the activity of predators. So. Um, as temperatures warm, uh, things like rattlesnakes and gopher snakes can become more active or at least uh, become active over a longer period of time and therefore heighten predation. So we really don't know the mechanism uh, behind the pattern, but the pattern seems to be relatively robust, at least with the factors that we looked at. So another thing that we did was we tried to look at what would happen uh, when land, if we project changes in land surface temperature and then how that would influence survival. So the stippled region represents the range of the banner-tailed kangaroo rat, which is pretty much a Chihuahuan desert endemic. The dark circles represent our sample sites, and then the isoplex either represent temperature on the left, or then um, apparent annual survival that would result from the model that we developed. And you can see, um, at least in the right-hand uh, part of the uh, picture, that uh, banner-tailed kangaroo rats have an annual survivorship that goes from about 0.45 up to about 0.65. However, if we project land surface temperatures to almost 100 years hence, um, or in the future, excuse me, you'll see that temperatures can increase by four to six and a half degrees, and that's gonna cause a, a large drop in, in potential survival. So as low as 0 0.3 in, in the mid part of the range. And that would indicate then that you know, banner tails would either have to move to more suitable parts of the range or, or they would, would become extirpated in certain parts of the range, depending on um, how uh, influential uh, survivorship is to their population dynamics. So some possible adaptation strategies for this particular rodent um, could be to protect populations that are located in regions that are currently suitable and predicted to remain suitable in the future. Um, also maintaining corridors that would facilitate dispersal between populations or at least allow for some level of geographic movement. And as you might imagine, with such a small rodent, you know, movement, um, I think their, their maximum 
dispersal distance is around the order of a couple hundred meters typically for natal dispersal, so it would take a while for these sort of populations to move across the landscape. And then uh, perhaps even more radical would be something like assisted colonization where we actually trap and move individuals from unsuitable areas to more suitable areas. Okay, so that's um, uh, it for banner-tailed kangaroo rats. The, the next study that I'd, I'd like to present would be one that is uh, focused on reintroducing black-tailed prairie dogs um, to areas within the Chihuahuan Desert grasslands. And this was um, conducted by another one of my former graduate students, Aaron Faka and uh, Verity Mathis, um, in conjunction with two colleagues from Israel, uh, Michael Cam and, and Ellie Geffen. So um, a brief history about black-tailed prairie dogs, if you're not familiar. Um, around the 1800s, they were estimated to, to number about 5 billion individuals. But by the late uh, 20th century or so, there was a 98% reduction across um, the range of the species, primarily due to habitat loss, um, government-sponsored eradication programs, and more recently, silvatic plague. And, and these um, impacts to prairie dog populations are continuing. If you look at their range, they're primarily located in the, in within the United States, um, sort of sinking into northern Mexico and into southern Canada. But perhaps what's more important is you can see that there's a number of precipitation regimes that exist across their range. And if we then look at precipitation within the southwest in particular, so here's uh, uh, sort of precipitation traces over time at four different sites in um, southern New Mexico. You can see that there's uh, a, lar a lot of spatial variation across these sites. And there's a lot of temporal variation as well where you can have extremely I wouldn't say extremely, but you can have high um, precipitation relative to low precipitation. And these sorts of precipitation patterns are a consequence of the monsoonal rain pattern that, that is typically common in the southwest. So here's an example in the Chiricahua Mountains where um, you can see where the uh, thundercloud is, is raining in a certain region, but then as you look further east, you can see that it's very sunny and, and not raining at all. So the monsoonal precipitation pattern helps to create this um, high level of spatial and temporal variation. In addition to that, if you were to compare um, average levels of precipitation from north to south across the prairie dog's range, you can see that during periods of gestation and lactation in more northerly climes that you get a, sort of a coupling of precipitation with these um, sort of reproductive periods that are energetically expensive for the prairie dog. And in contrast, when you look through at southern um, grassland sites, you can see that precipitation is extremely low during gestation and lactation, and that precipitation doesn't occur in, until after the sort of expensive lactation period is over. So as a consequence, if we look at prairie dogs in desert grassland systems, they typically receive less rainfall, they experience more variable rainfall, and the rainfall pattern is decoupled from the reproductive period. So if precipitation is a major driver of primary productivity and because prairie dogs are herbivores and primary consumers, um, the prediction that prairie dog populations in these desert grasslands will exhibit variable demographic rates that should be correlated with this monsoonal precipitation pattern. So our objectives um, were essentially to look at changes in body mass and use body mass as a proxy to explain um, variation in reproduction as well as variation in survival and then look at reproduction and survival and scale that up to uh, population size. And this study was conducted on the Armadares Ranch, which is located about um, 70 miles north of, of Las Cruces and it's one of uh, ranches owned by Ted Turner. And our field methods consisted of um, capturing and marking adult prairie dogs as well as juveniles. And then um, we also use marked recite techniques, um, especially not only to recite marked individuals, but also to identify um, uh, female maternity burrows and then to document female fecundity by the number of pups that were emerging from those burrows. <coughs> the pups emerged from the burrows. We did everything we could to capture those particular pups and, and mark those as well. We used a series of analyses to um, look at how precipitation might influence body mass and then how body mass could subsequently influence reproduction. Uh, we also used um, 
uh, Cormac Jolly feeder models and program mark and, and uh, an AIP approach to look at survival. And then we estimated population size using closed population uh, models um, with mercury site and mercury capture data. And so from there, we ran about 23,000 trap nights. We had almost 3,000 captures of nearly 600 individuals. And we had a mean recapture rate of about 0.35, which is very similar to our reciting rate of, of about 0.34. So we were able to combine those, those two sets of data um, for subsequent analysis. And so now if you look at precipitation at a, a nearby weather station at the Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge, you can see that it's, it's also highly variable. But there was a period of time when we were working. Um, so we started the work in 2003 and con continued it from 2003 through 2005. And in 2003, we're, we were at 64% um, of the average precipitation. So we just experienced three years of below average precipitation when we started the study. Um, one of the things that we also found was that if we look at the um, body masses of males and females, that they were highly correlated with the cumulative precipitation in the preceding four months. So that suggested that precipitation, which then would impact primary productivity, was then influencing body mass. And then when we looked at females, um, we looked at the relationship of the probability of females being pregnant relative to body mass. And as you know here, when, when females are around 11 or 1200 grams, there's about a you know, 100% chance that they're going to be pregnant. But when they're down around five or 600 grams, they have a very low probability of being pregnant. As female body mass increases, there's also an increase in, in uh, litter size. And as female body mass increases, young are weaned earlier, and they emerge from the burrows earlier, earlier and start to forage on their own. So to give you sort of just a visual example of the conditions in different years when we were um, conducting the study, this is the condition on one of the colonies known as Deep Well Colony. And you can see in May of 2004, so spring of 2004, um, there really wasn't hardly uh, any vegetation on the colony at all. And mean female body mass was around 600 grams. Only 18% of the females were pregnant, and no pups emerged from any of the burrows that year on that particular colony. The following year, female body mass was double what it was the previous year. 85% of the females were pregnant, and the average number of pups per litter was five. So the amount of precipitation and subsequent primary productivity can really influence reproduction. If we look at juvenile growth rates in 2003, you can see um, that was the year when uh, precipitation was the lowest during the uh, study and the nadir of that three-year below average precipitation period. You can see that uh, of the pups that were born after about 130 days, there were only two pups that were alive. And, and the next year, those pups were never captured either. So none of the pups in 2003 actually survived their first year. And subsequently, in 2004 and 2005, those pups actually did survive, and they had higher growth rates than they did in 2003. Similarly, in 2003, the survival rates of adults, they, they were time dependent. And this is where we had the um, good or solid data for at least two colonies. And there we can, we can see that uh, in 2003, the survivor, annual survivorship, uh, excuse me, monthly survivorship of, of the uh, adults was, was depressed as well. And then finally, when we look at population size, of the six colonies that we ended up monitoring over the course of the study, five of the, of the six had declined by about 68%. And then we went back three years after that, and of the 19 reintroduced colonies, five had been extirpated. And subsequent to that even, so I, I had talked with some of the ranch managers in around um, 2011, and they said even more of the colonies had been extirpated, and they had stopped reintroducing prairie dogs because the, the dogs were doing so poorly on their colony. So in conclusion, um, it seems that the variation in bio rate is correlated with this monsoonal precipitation pattern that we see in the southwest, and that when you have low precipitation, you get reduced vital rates. Uh, reproduction uh, declines, juvenile survival and growth rates decline, adult survival also declines, and um, th that results in a reduction in population size on a majority of the colonies. So reintroducing prairie dogs into the southwestern U.S., and in particular in desert grasslands, 
really needs to be um, carefully evaluated and may work in some instances and not others. So possible adaptation strategies. Um, with respect to the existing colonies, you might want to conserve those that are in more music parts of the species range, such as the front range of Colorado, which is now experiencing a lot of uh, urbanization. And we should probably also try to maintain connectivity among colonies in suitable habitats so that individuals can still move or the populations can be replenished if they become depressed. And certainly now we have the interaction with silvatic plague that is sort of exacerbating that sort of problem. With respect to reintroducing colonies, we might want to consider reintroduction sites a little bit more carefully than what we have done in the past, at least um, in this particular instance. And if we use um, or are going to reintroduce animals into desert grasslands, we might want to select reintroduction stock that evolved in a desert system. All of the um, prairie dogs that were reintroduced to the Armendaris Ranch actually came from one of another one of Ted Turner's ranches, the Vermejo Ranch which is in northern New Mexico, and so those dogs were much more adapted to uh, a more mesic condition. And we actually tried to get funding to do sort of a reciprocal transplantation experiment, or translocation experiment, but that, that didn't work. Okay, so that's, that's it for prairie dogs. So now um, the one last study that I'd like to talk about, and that would be um, uh, the application of occupancy modeling to evaluate intraguild predation in um, a carnivore system that involves um, the coyote, which is in the upper foot of the photograph, and then the pit box in the lower photograph. And perhaps maybe a more apt title might be just an exploration of intraguild predation between these two species at White Sands National Monument, which is clearly a desert system. And um, this research was done by one of my former graduate students, Quinn Robinson, in conjunction with one of my former undergraduate students, David Bustos, who is now the um, Natural Resources Manager at White Sands National Monument. So um, and the reason we started this study was the park itself was uh, aware, the resource managers there were aware of this predatory relationship that existed between uh, coyotes and pit boxes. And they were concerned because pit box are sort of a park icon uh, in, in two respects. I mean, they're certainly probably ecologically important as, as um, an important desert predator, uh, but they also were important to visitor experience. Many visitors go out and they walk the, the white sands and they see the, the prints of the pit fox and sometimes they even observe pit fox on moonlit nights. And so the park was concerned about the future persistence of the pit fox. In particular, um, they were concerned because uh, if, if climate does change and it gets even warmer than it is now, they, they felt that this could negatively influence the resource base and then maybe even subsequently enhance predation by coyotes on pit boxes. So we suggested that one of the first things we, we might want to do is to look at this interaction um, between uh, coyotes, the intraguild predator, and their intraguild prey, the pit fox, and first examine their distribution using occupancy modeling to see if they're partition, partitioning the, the park up um, spatially, and so that maybe the conflict between the two species um, is actually lessened than what we might imagine. Okay, so with regard to intraguild predation, I don't know um, if you're familiar or not, but it's an extreme form of interference competition where two species not only compete with one another, but they're also involved in a type of predatory relationship. And in its simplest form, which is essentially the, the form that exists between coyotes and pit boxes, you have uh, an animal that's referred to as a predator, such as a coyote, and its intraguild prey, which is the pit box. And then both of these guys have shared prey, in this case, a small mammal. And intraguild uh, predation is a widespread interaction found throughout various uh, predatory guilds, and it has uh, the potential to cause multiple attendant effects. Um, for example, um, there's a great study that was done by um, the Burgers in uh, Yellowstone, which showed that in the presence of wolves, they depress coyotes. This results in an increase in pronghorns by reducing predation on, on pronghorn fawns and, and probably adult pronghorns as well. And so a type of trophic cascade exists. But when you remove the, a wolf from the system, you have mesopredator release, which increases the coyotes and then decreases pronghorn numbers. And so that's just one example of, of sort of what can happen in, in an intraguild uh, predation relationship. Okay, so theory suggests that um, the 
a co-occurrence of these two species is related to increasing resource enrichment. And so when you have really low resources, you can only have the intraguild prey, which is a um, better exploitative competitor. But as resources increase, um, both species can co-occur. The coyote can invade the system because now there's enough food to support the coyote. But the coyote numbers uh, don't reach a level where heightened predation excludes the pit fox. But then as you increase resources even further, um, there could be the potential for coyote populations to increase so much so that then their predatory effect on the pit fox could result in, in extirpation. And this was the sort of relationship or uh, idea that the park was, was worried about, although um, in, in this instance, you know, we're talking about having less resources. And so consequently, you might predict at the outset that, that this would be a better situation for pit foxes because coyotes would have a harder time living there. Okay, well, there's also the potential for sort of alternative um, IGP states in, in such a system. Uh, initially, you can have a state of low resource abundance, which would only support the pit fox and its shared prey. However, as you um, increase um, uh, the productivity, so that would be, re be uh, represented by the red line here, as you increase productivity, there is the potential for coyotes to invade the system. And so you could have both predators in the system where pit foxes would be at a, a lower level of abundance. However, alternatively, you could have a situation where resources could increase, but, but somewhat less, and you could only have pit foxes in the system. So this is a situation where there could be an alternative um, intraguild predator state depending on the abundance of the, the shared prey and the subsequent response of the two predator populations. And then finally, if you have um, really high resource abundance, as shown in green, you typically would have no pit foxes and, and an increase in the intraguild predator itself. So we were interested in exploring this relationship further to try and um, yield some information that the park might be able to uh, use. And uh, I'm not sure what management actions they might be able to apply, but, but they were curious about what could happen between uh, coyotes and pit foxes with changes in abundance of prey. So we used um, uh, traditional two species, single season occupancy models, and these are great for estimating the occupancy of organisms when the probability of detection is um, less than uh, one. Whoops, excuse me. And um, the, there are two probabilities that are estimated then, the probability of detection and the probability of occupancy. And uh, these models then allow the incorporation of covariates. And so we measure different covariates that could be expected to influence either uh, probability of detection or probability of occupancy. And then when you uh, take these models and use a conditional two species occupancy model, you can determine how the presence of one species might influence the presence of another species. And so in this case, the application of a conditional two species model was, was really pertinent to an intraguild predation. Again, we used a hierarchical modeling approach in modeling selection. We first um, identified the best detection covariates and then the most important occupancy covariates for each of the species. Then we used the two species occupancy model to explore interactions between the two species. And throughout, we used this information theoretic approach of model selection where we incorporated an a priori um, set of covariates. Relative to those covariates, um, we factors that could potentially influence detection or occupancy. And so for uh, detection itself, we had mostly categorical covariates, such as year, season, and whether or not uh, land cover was either shrubland or non-shrubland. And then um, we also invo uh, invoked nighttime land search temperature from some of the work that we had done previously with the banner-tailed kangaroo rat. And then because we had baited the sites, we felt that bait age could potentially influence the probability of detection as well. Because this would put a bait out, and the bait would rot after a period of time, and, and so uh, scent might change. Um, we also measured covariates to predict um, probability of occupancy, and these primarily, uh, at least the first three, were uh, prey covariates, including uh, rodent or lagomorph density, rodent biomass, and then ground dwelling and birdless biomass. And then we also included nighttime land surface temperature because we thought that some habitats or land covers could be hotter than others, and then therefore they might be avoided 
uh, remote cameras, and um, we randomly stratified um, these cameras in uh, six different land cover types, and uh, we covered about 75% of the um, uh, monuments with these cameras. And we, when I say that we randomly stratified, we stratified them uh, by habitat and then randomly placed them within each habitat. So 19% occurred within the Gypsum Dune land itself, 16% uh, in the Pickleweed Playa, which is also a, a very sparse um, habitat type with regards to vegetation. Um, then there was interdunal grasslands and um, four-winged saltbrush shrublands, um, gypsum outcrop shrublands, and finally mesquite shrublands. So these were the six different land cover types that we looked at. We calculated something called the species interaction factor. This is a, a parameter that's used to look at uh, the occurrence of the two species when all of the variables are <coughs> So for example, if the species occur independently, the SIF would be equal to one. If it was greater than one, um, they're occurring more likely than you would expect by chance, and if it was less than one, it indicates some level of avoidance. Okay, so here's some of the data as far as the distribution of prey. This is for lagomorph density, and you can see that the shrublands have higher um, densities of lagomorphs than non-shrublands, and that um, when we look at rodents, we see a very similar pattern where there's more rodents in the shrublands than in the non-shrubland habitat, but there's a slightly different pattern um, when we're looking at invertebrate abundance. And we see that both um, introduced grassland, I'm sorry, interdunal grasslands here and gypsum dune lands actually have a, a relatively high invertebrate abundance compared to some of the other shrubland habitats. So here's uh, the results of the carnivore image data. And you can see the tan bars are kit fox pictures at a particular camera site, and the brown bars are coyotes. And the uh, kit foxes. Uh, were photographed relatively frequently within the dune lands, um, within the playa, and within the interdunal grasslands, but they're found in all habitats. So you can see them over here in the shrubland habitats as well, um, and down here in four-wing uh, saltbrush shrubland. But the coyotes seem to be more restricted to shrubland habitat types per se. And so just anecdotally looking at the uh, distribution of the camera images, it seems that there seems to be some spatial separation between the two species. So if you look at the probability of detecting a coyote, um, it was uh, the average probability was around 0 0.31. And um, uh, you can see that shrubland has a positive effect. So uh, typically we um, observed coyotes in shrubland or detected them there. Um, in contrast, the probability of detecting a kit fox was slightly lower, and the shrubland effect was negative. So we were more likely to detect kit foxes in non-shrubland habitats than in shrubland habitats. If we looked at uh, probability of occupancy now, so whether or not the animal is present after being detected, the two variables that were most important in predicting um, the probability of occupancy of coyotes were both um, rodent biomass and lagomorph density. And we never included these two variables in the same model because they were highly correlated but you can see that both of the um, regression coefficients were positive uh, for these two prey types. In contrast, when we looked at um, the occupancy for kit foxes, we had a constant occupancy. As a matter of fact, none of the variables that we had used actually explained occupancy of kit foxes very well. And the um, weights of the, what we termed the um, the Eco Information Criterion weights were really distributed across a variety of different models. So none of the variables that we used actually had much explanatory power when it came to looking at occupancy of kit boxes, which was somewhat um, uh, counterintuitive at least. So here we are looking at the uh, two species um, uh, conditional occupancy model. And with this, what we're trying to do is look at the effect of the presence of the coyote on the presence of the kit fox. And in absence of coyotes, kit foxes had a probability of occupancy that was higher than in the presence of coyotes. So we can look at this relationship in a, in a different form, um, and that is uh, we can look at the odds of kit foxes being present versus absence in the presence of coyotes. 
And um, if we look at it in that way, um, the odds of tick foxes being present versus absent at a site where coyotes were present is about 2.2 to 1. And the odds of tick foxes being present versus absent at a site where coyotes were absent is about 7.9 to 1. And that translates to uh, an odds of about tick foxes being four times more likely to be present rather than absent at sites where coyotes are not found, right? So what that translates to is that tick foxes definitely avoid coyotes. That said, when we look at the distribution of coyotes, we find that the coyote distribution is, is really tied to the type of land cover. So um, coyotes are found in shrublands almost um, uh, near one, right? So that, that, that's the habitat that they typically occupy is the shrubland habitat. And that contrasts with these sort of really uh, prey deficient habitats such as the tickleweed fly and the gypsum greenland where the probability of occupancy is only about 0.2. So again, if we take a, an, an odds approach and looking at the, the odds of coyotes being uh, present in different habitat types, um, the odds of presence versus absence in a prey rich shrubland is about 332 to 1 and the odds of coyotes being present versus absent in, say, these um, very prey poor habitats like the pickleweed fly in the gypsum greenland is about one to four. And so what that means is coyotes are 1,300 times more likely to be present versus absent in shrubland habitat types, which are prey rich, than in sites um, that are prey poor where um, tip boxes are also found. So coyotes are not fond, or they're fond of the shrublands, but they're not fond of the dunes. And yet we see tip foxes in the dunes in these very prey poor habitats. So now if we look at the species interaction factor, where this is a, a, a measure of occurrence between the two species when we've already accounted for their um, relationships with the, the landscape, if you will, with regards to the uh, presence of prey, et cetera. We see that um, tip foxes don't really avoid coyotes in the shrublands when they both occur there, but that they do avoid coyotes in these non-shrubland habitat types. And one of the reasons that we have for, for interpreting this information is that when you go into a shrubland habitat, coyotes are going to be there. And also shrubland habitats are um, uh, more closed canopy habitats, and tip foxes basically can slip away or avoid coyotes once coyotes are detected. However, when they find sign of a coyote in a very open habitat, tip foxes immediately try to avoid them because this is the sort of situation they would be in. Um, in an open dune land habitat like this, um, coyotes would, would tend to, um, uh, or excuse me, tip foxes would tend to avoid uh, coyotes because they, they can't. <coughs> So, in summary, um, previous studies that have compared space use have suggested that coyotes choose particular habitat types and that tip foxes then avoid the coyotes, and certainly they do. However, um, if we look at intraguild predation theory, um, it suggests that this is sort of a simplistic view because intraguild predators are not always free to select among all the available habitats because they may not be able to support themselves in prey poor habitats in particular. So tip foxes, because of their smaller body size and adaptations to arid environments, they can basically exploit habitats that coyotes cannot. And so, for example, um, if we look at some previous work that had been conducted by uh, Rick Golightly and Bob Omar, um, they showed that a desert coyote typically requires about 504 grams to meet its energy requirements, but it requires about 1,780 grams of wet prey mass to meet its um, water requirements. So in a sense, coyotes actually are foraging for water, um, that it's more for water than they are for energy. And in order to meet that, a coyote would have to kill a single jackrabbit, a single tick fox, or it would have to consume 43 kangaroo rats in order to meet water requirements. In contrast, tip foxes require um, much less with regards to energy and water, 101 and 175 grams of wet prey mass respectively, and they could actually meet those requirements by consuming only four kangaroo rats. So um, tip foxes are uh, much better at handling um, the desert environment than the coyote is. 
So um, in conclusion, then, um, marked differences in prey abundance could explain uh, why other st some studies have found spatial partitioning between these species, and, and in some cases they haven't, but in our case, we both found spatial partitioning and co-occurrence, that the two species co-occurred in the shrubland habitats, but that they, only the tick foxes could occur in the non-shrubland habitats when prey abundance was low. And so um, our work sort of follows this sort of classical um, uh, integral predation theory, and that is that different levels of prey enrichment are going to influence the dynamics between these two carnivore species. And um, this was the first time that uh, concurrent IGP states were sort of recognizing such a system. And it has relevance to the management of tick foxes and coyotes within White Sands National Monument because um, tick foxes can occupy habitats with lower prey abundance than coyotes. And so if climate change is, is um, going to occur and, and could potentially negatively uh, influence the abundance of prey, for example, like the, the abundance of kangaroo rats, um, coyotes would have a harder time uh, persisting in the park than tick foxes would. And um, given that, uh, one of the things that we did not do is we certainly did not estimate the abundance of either one of the predators. And so density-independent factors like a prolonged drought could certainly influence the potential for persistence and could result in extirpation if these populations were small and subsequently vulnerable um, to, say, you know, uh, uh, several years of low prey availability. So um, in this case, then, what the park should probably decide to do next would be to explore the population dynamics and interactions between these two species in a little greater detail to look at survival and, and reproduction and, and cause-specific mortality, and then try to relate these vital rates to environmental drivers to see if there's something that they may be able to do to enhance the monument to, um, for tick box persistence uh, relative to coyotes themselves. So with that, um, that's sort of the end. I'd be happy to <laughs> take questions if you guys have any, and then if you're at all interested in the work, um, the work has been published in a, a different venues, and I'd be happy to supply anybody with the PDFs or any of the other references that I used during the talk. So, thank you. Thanks, Gary, and thanks for ending precisely on time. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> um, if people want to stick around, and uh, maybe we can have uh, a, a few questions. Uh, I believe everybody's unmuted, or if you, you know, you can unmute yourself if you've done that. So, uh, if we have any questions for Gary, guess not. Okay. I, I had one question. So how did the Park Service um, take the the information that you gave them? How did they react to that, and did they have any other plans? Well, initially, we were um, uh, hopefully going to uh, extend the study and, and look at cost-specific mortality by capturing and collaring both species, but we haven't been able to get the funding to do that, although the park is interested. But one of the things that they did was they created a, um, uh, it's part of their visitor center experience now, and so they've created sort of a diorama to explain the relationships between the two species, and they're using some of the data at least to inform the public um, about the study and, and hopefully about the fact that, you know, kit foxes would be able to persist and coyotes might not. But that's about all that they've done thus far. And the, Funds are pretty tight right now for the park. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, and uh, any any questions uh, just over the phone. Well, um, I want to thank Gary for giving this presentation. It was really good. three different examples. And I want to remind everyone that was recorded, and it will be on uh, the Desert LCC YouTube, YouTube channel. Um, and usually Victoria sends around an announcement a couple of days after the, the presentation with, with that link. Um, 
So uh, once again, uh, thanks for joining, and thank you, Gary, for presenting. Yep. Thanks for inviting me. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.